House of Commons, Projet de loi, message de la Chambre des Communes. Pursuant to the order made earlier this day, the message from the House of Commons on Bill C-45. Senator Harder. Je propose que... Honourable colleagues, I move that the Senate uh, deem the uh, amendments, amendments 31 uh, for Bill C-45, an act concerning uh, cannabis and uh, dealing with uh, certain groups and other areas of the criminal code that the Senate not insist on amendments 3, 4, 7, 8, 17A, 23, 25, 26, 32, 33, and 38, to which the House of Commons has not agreed that a message be given to the House of Commons to so inform them. It is moved by Senator Harder, seconded by Honourable Senator Mitchell, that the sh shall I dispense on debate, Senator Harder. Senators, I rise to speak to the message from the House of Commons on Bill C-45. If the Senate accepts this message, Parliament will have passed the legislation necessary to legalize and strictly regulate cannabis in Canada. Following a regulatory period of approximately 8 to 12 weeks, the government will proclaim C-45 into force, lifting the criminal prohibition that has been in place for nearly 100 years. Canadians will then be able to legally purchase cannabis in stores across the country. Passing this bill will mean the end of an historic era of prohibition that has punished Canadians with a criminal sanction for what is essentially a health decision. Over the years, how many Canadians have needlessly been given the social stigma and employment barrier of a criminal conviction? And how many public resources have been extended, expended to achieve that result? As I speak to you today, of course, the criminal framework remains in full legal force. With Bill C-45, we will end an ineffectual policy that has failed to protect our young people from the particular harms and risks of consuming cannabis at an early age. We will instead commit to a public health and education model already underway that has been extremely successful in reducing, for example, smoking rates for tobacco. With C45, we will remove an unreasonable anxiety inflicted on millions of otherwise law-abiding adults who consume cannabis in a manner that others may consume beer or wine. The state will at last respect, respect an adult's ability to choose whether or not to consume cannabis. As well, the state will no longer deprive those individuals of harm reduction measures like <coughs> accurate labing, labeling for potency, quality assurance of no harmful contaminants, and alternative forms of consumption to smoking, which is so damaging to the lungs. Honorable Senators, there may come a day, perhaps not in the not too distant future, when we remember prohibition as absurd. By ending prohibition, we also end an awkward and unnecessary irritation for police, enhancing respect for our criminal justice system by removing a crime that the public, we must surely admit, no longer takes seriously. On the economic side, if we accept the message on Bill C-45, we will have passed legislation to begin the transfer of a $7 billion market from organized crime and illicit distributors to licensed Canadian producers. These new businesses will pay their taxes and create good-paying, long-term and sustainable jobs in our communities. How often do we find opportunities of this scale? If we pass Bill C-45, criminalization will end, harm reduction will begin, and so will the economic growth that will accompany a legitimate, strictly controlled marketplace. The Senate has done a thorough job of conducting sober second thought in reviewing this legislation. Some might have liked to see things move along a little faster, but on a social change of such significance, the Senate has been on the thorough end of thorough. Future students of Canadian political science may one day take the Senate's work on Bill C-45 as a case study. This may particularly be so with the institution in such transition with, and with national leaders currently proposing different visions for the Senate's future. 
How will they look at our decisions? These students might ask, did senators carry out their duties on behalf of Canadians according to the Senate's constitutional role? Did, it wor did the, its work fulfill the functions and standards described by the Supreme Court of Canada? Did the appointed upper body conduct sober second thought that the country's founders envisaged? I think the answer so far, Senators, is a resounding yes. Turning to the motion before us, I now submit that the Senate should concur with the decision of Canada's elected members of Parliament. That chamber has accepted quite a number of amendments, and the government has noted our observations and responded to Indigenous concerns raised by Senators by formalizing important commitments. Members of Parliament have disagreed with Senators on some points, declining some amendments that have strong support in this chamber. I will go into the reasons shortly, but on the specific policies of C45, as always, elected members of Parliament will be accountable to the public for their decisions. It is time to respect those decisions, and with cannabis legislation, Canadians are ready for us to move forward. To put into context, since C45 arrived in the Senate on November 28th, nearly seven months ago, many Senators have worked hard to review and improve this legislation. First and foremost, I would join many Canadians in thanking our colleague Senator Tony Dean, the sponsor of C45, for his leadership and dedication in reviewing this major public policy change. Senator Dean's first priority has been to ensure that Senators have a maximum amount of reliable, evidence-based information available to consider all aspects of C45. And drawing from our debates on medical assistance in dying, Senator Dean's drive to better organize these deliberations has, with the cooperation of all groups, made for more coherent, substantive, and publicly accessible proceedings. Senator, Dean, Senator Dean's policy command, open mind, and public interest focus have, for all of us, I think, demonstrated what bill sponsorship can be in a chamber of sober second thought. All Canadians should know that Senator Dean has worked tirelessly on their behalf. And, and let me thank all Senators for your determination to deal with this bill in such a comprehensive fashion. You will remember the Committee of the Whole when we heard directly from the Cabinet Ministers responsible for this bill, the Minister of Health, Jeanette Petipa-Taylor, the Minister of Justice, Jody Wilson-Raybo, and the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness, Ralph Goodale. We also heard from Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministers of Health and Justice, Bill Blair. Mr. Blair's experience from nearly 40 years in law enforcement, including at the most senior leadership level, has been critical to advancing the legalization process, pr process responsibly and with an absolute focus on public health and public safety. Over the past months, the Senate conducted reviews of Bill C-45 at five of its committees, bringing their focus and expertise to bear on important subjects. The Aboriginal Peoples Committee examined indi Indigenous concerns relating to legalization. The Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee examined new deterrent measures in the bill to ensure cannabis is strictly controlled. The Foreign Affairs and International Trade Committee looked at Canada's international obligations. The National Security and Defence Committee studied issues relating to the border. And finally, Social Affairs, Science and Technology Committee incorporated and balanced these perspective, perspectives in conducting its comprehensive review of the bill with a focus on overall public health and safety. Let me take a moment to recognize and thank committee leaderships and members who did such, so much of the hard work to raise important issues and bring them forward for thir further debate and deliberation. In particular, I would like to thank and acknowledge Social Affairs Committee Chair Art Eggleton. We are grateful for his leadership, judiciousness, and experience in governance and legislating as that committee worked to consolidate and balance all the interests involved in this major social change. I believe the, the, the committee's comprehensive report will be foundational in guiding the legislative process as it moves forward, and Canadians undoubtedly uh, refines, uh, refines and improves our new system in the years ahead. Senators will, of course, continue to play an important role in monitoring and improving the national cannabis framework, including through Bill C-45's reporting and review mechanisms. The Senate's five committee study 
included testimony from over 200 witnesses representing various sectors and sources of expertise from governments, Indigenous communities and organizations, law enforcement, professional association, ac acad academia, and business. These hearings allowed Senators to identify issues of concern and to challenge the elected House to take a sober look at specifics and were necessary to do better. The Aboriginal People's Committee fulfilled this function extremely well. The committee identified and advanced legitimate concerns about how cannabis legalization might affect Indigenous communities across Canada. As a result of this work, Senators will know that the Minister of Health and the Minister of Indigenous Ser Services, Jane Philpott, wrote letters to Senator Senators Dick and Tanis, Chair and Deputy Chair of the Committee, formally addressing important issues in Indigenous contexts. These issues include public health, culturally and linguistically specific educational materials, Section 35 jurisdiction, and new fiscal frameworks. That letter formalized major government commitments to Indigenous partners in a transparent fashion. It also demonstrated once again that the Senate has come into its own as an effective, influential, and indeed indispensable platform in Parliament for the voices of Indigenous peoples. For Canada, true reconciliation with Indigenous peoples is necessary, and with the guidance of Indigenous leaders in the Senate, this chamber is doing some of the heavy lifting. The Senate's thorough review of Bill C-45 led to many amendments, some of which have been accepted in the other place and some of which have been declined. Given the exceptional amount of work that went into the Senate study of this bill, I understand that some of these outcomes are, are frustrating for some. I know that some of these frustrations are rooted in deeply held policy views and personal values, and that much disagreement will not end with our vote on this me message, whatever its result. However, I wish to express to you that the government took all of your concerns seriously. In the end, as you know, the, the government disagreed on some points. As I said, I will go into the reasons the government has taken these views, the views it has, which ministers, and in particular the Minister of Health, have asked that I share with you on the record for their benefit, and in as detailed and transparent a fashion as possible. And I would note that it is possible to listen and to disagree. In fact, I'm, sure about, I'm surely about to cause that experience for some in this chamber. But I admit that where the government and ultimately the House of Commons has disagreed, it has done so respectfully and straightforwardly and in acknowledgement of the value the Senate has added to Canada's policies and debates surrounding cannabis legislation. In the other place, Minister of Health and the, the Honourable Jeanette Petipa-Taylor expressed her gratitude for the Senate's work. She outlined the government's rationale for accepting some amendments and declining others. Let me start with those amendments the government has accepted. First, the government agreed with the Senate amendment to increase the allowable period of, pay, uh, of time to pay a ticket from 30 to 60 days. This amendment will make it easier for individuals, especially those living in remote areas, to pay a fine on time. The government also agreed with the Senate amendment to specify timelines for the three-year mandatory review of the legislation by establishing a deadline of 18 months to complete and table a report before both Houses of Parliament. On the issue of reporting, I would emphasize that the message from the other place goes even further. Indeed, the House has taken the initiative of specifying that the scope of the review will include the impact of cannabis legislation on Indigenous communities as well as the impact of home cultivation within the overall framework. These concerns were at the heart of Senators' deliberations, and their formalization in Bill C-45 reporting requirements gives these policy issues a central focus in the evaluation of legalization framework going forward. I know this change is short of what many Senators wanted, particularly on home cultivation. However, this change is directly responsive to the Senate's work and, result in, and will result in meaningful and transparent evaluation of C-45's enacted policies. This review and reporting requirement of Bill C-45 will allow Canadians and parliamentarians from both chambers to hold the government to account. The government also agreed to amend the definition of cannabis accessory 
to ensure that products such as soil and fertilizer already federally regulated are not subject to the stringent restrictions on promotion that exist in Bill C-45. These are a few of the examples of the improvements the Senate has made to public policy on cannabis legislation by way of amendments, in addition to its contributions through observations and the securing of government commitments. Now let me speak to the amendments that the Senate proposed that the other place did not support. I will start with the issue of home cultivation. The Senate proposed an amendment such that provinces could disallow home cultivation entirely. As it stands, Bill C-45 allows Canadians to cultivate up to four cannabis plants for personal use. C-45 also allows provinces to heavily regulate and restrict how and where home cultivation may occur. Most importantly, that includes through landlord-tenant agreements that can prohibit home cultivation for rentals, which is where we have heard much of the concern. Condo boards can also prohibit home cannabis cultivation for condo owners. As Parliamentary Secretary Blair stated today in the House, the government has acknowledged that any province can place limits on the number of plants up to four and can place restrictions and regulations determining limits on location, safety, security, health concerns, and the size of fences. They can also impose a requir requirement for permits and fees to be paid. Taking full advantage of the flexibility inherent in C45, many provinces plan to impose restrictions that they deem to be appropriate. For example, Nova Scotia has indicated that it will allow landlords to prohibit cannabis cultivation and smoking in rental units. New Brunswick has adopted lock and key provisions. Indoor cultivation must take place in a separate locked space. Cannabis cultivated outdoors must be surrounded by a locked enclosure. Prince Edward Island, plants must be inaccessible to minors. Saskatchewan has introduced amendments to its Residential Tenancy Amendment Act, giving landlords the right to impose rules prohibiting the possession, use, and growth of cannabis in the rental unit. Alberta would allow indoor personal cultivation only. In addition, Alberta has also made it clear that renters, condo dwellers, and those who live in multifamily dwellings may be restricted from growing cannabis in their homes based on rules established in <coughs> rental agreements or condominium bylaws and has committed to working to educate landlords, renters, condo boards on the options available to them. In British Columbia, it is provided that no plant can be visible from a public space and an adult cannot grow cannabis plants at different dwelling houses at the same time. Northwest Territories has proposed amendments to their Condominium Act and Residential Tenancies Act, specifying that tenancy agreements and condo bylaw bylaws can prohibit cannabis cultivation and smoking. Some provinces and territories have prohibited cultivation in dwellings that are also a daycare, preschool, or licensed family home, child care home. The point is, colleagues, there is a lot of flexibility and a lot of ability to restrict and control home cultivation. In terms of the number of plants for private dwellings, provincial limits can include restricting home cult cultivation to a single plant. So that, so that is what we are down to, Honourable Senators, a single plant. It is important to remember the issue of home cultivation was carefully studied by the Task Force on Cannabis Legalization and Regulation and a subject brought forward as part of its cross-Canada consultation. The Task Force found overwhelming support amongst Canadians for home cultivation with 92% of respondents in favour. Proponents cited a variety of arguments for allowing home cultivation, including cost, personal preference, and access for those in rural and remote communities. The task force went on to recommend allowing home cultivation. It concluded, and I quote, there was a recognition that banning home cultivation altogether would lead to increased criminalization of individuals and growth of the illicit market." End quote. C45 contains many policy instruments to avoid these outcomes. One of these instruments, and in the government's view an indispensable one, is allowing adults to grow up to four cannabis plants, a number that provinces can restrict. As a standalone policy, it is obvious that allowing home cultivation would not be sufficient 
to meet the government's objective of displacing the illegal market. However, it is a key, key component of a greater whole. Excluding home cultivation altogether would, in the government's view, undermine the national objective pursued by Bill C-45 of reducing the ongoing criminal trade in cannabis and ending prohibition. In the House of Commons in recent days, in addition to members of the Governing Caucus, mem members of Parliament from the New Democratic Party and the Green Party, as well as independents, supported this policy view. Personal cultivation will discourage people with limited access to can legal cannabis from sourcing from the illicit market. Such persons would include those without easy access to a store or online platform, lower income persons who cannot afford the store price, or persons living in rural and remote areas. In the broader sense, it is important to remember that Bill C-45's purpose is to legalize, regulate, and strictly restrict access to cannabis across the country. In, in the other places view, a small amount of home cultivation furthers this overall purpose by discouraging a segment of the illicit market. Authorizing a small amount of home cultivation is also consistent with C45's overall intent to create a federal, federal framework for all recreational cannabis production, including through the proposed licensing system. This comprehensive framework, again, has been developed with the objective of supplanting the illicit market over time. In addition to furthering this objective, the government is also of the policy view that adults should have the individual freedom to engage in a small amount of home cultivation on their own property. This activity is analogous to brewing beer or making wine at home for personal consumption. It would, of course, be subject to rental agreements or condo board rules, as I've outlined. Frankly, Honourable Senators, some Canadians enjoy cultivation as an activity, and elected members of Parliament have chosen to afford them that freedom. With the end of criminal prohibition, members of Parliament simply do not want to see citizens penalized for this activities if individuals respect provincial limits and private agreements. With respect to sharing uh, with youth and social sharing, as Parliamentary Secretary Blair discussed in the others, other place, the Senate also proposed an amendment to prohibit pr prosecution of indictment by indictment where an 18 or 19 year old distributes five grams or less of dried cannabis to a youth that is uh, two years younger. In addition, the amendment would allow for tickets to be issued in such circumstances. Finally, this amendment would also allow for a parent or guardian to share cannabis with their 16 or 17 year old children at home. The government has respectfully declined that amendment, stating that in its view, such an amendment is contrary to Bill C-45's objectives. The bill's purpose is to protect the health and safety of young persons by restricting their access to cannabis and strengthening penalties for adults who provide cannabis to minors or use them to commit cannabis-related offenses. As, again, as Parliamentary Secretary Blair indicated, the parental exception created by this amendment would serve to create a legal supply, chain, uh, supply channel in the Cannabis Act for 16 or 17-year-old teenagers or wards at home. A youth could in turn distribute up to five grams of dry cannabis received from a parent or guardian to youth outside the home. The reduction in potential severity of the distribution offence, that is through the close in age Senate proposal, would in turn encourage such activity. The government would not wish to see such a consequence. When it comes to preventing youth access to cannabis, the government is being clear that it wishes to take a strict approach and in no way condone youth usage of cannabis. Another amendment that has been respectfully declined by the other place concerns the nexus of C-45 and the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, known as the IRPA. The proposed amendment would amend C-45 to create an exemption from the serious crim criminality provisions of the IRPA for a set of convictions under C-45. The government has declined this amendment because, in its view, it is inappropriate to exempt certain classes of serious crime from the IRPA and not others. In the case of Bill C-45, 
Convictions for offenses under C-45 with repercussions under the IRPA include illegal selling or exporting cannabis or using a young person to do so. In addition to discretionary remedies at the level of law enforcement, individuals have ex access to existing discretionary relief mechanisms under Canada's immigration framework, including humanitarian and compassionate considerations. That said, Senators have identified an important issues. issue. Senators have expressed concern about the immigration consequences of less serious convictions under C-45 that nevertheless trigger serious criminal criminality because of the offense's high maximum penalties subject only to discretionary relief. The government recognizes the importance of this issue. In the government's view, the IRPA's approach to criminality should be consistent and comprehensive but it should also be fair and compassionate. Colleagues, I would like to read into the record a letter uh, uh, from uh, the Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizen, Ahmed Hussein, uh, to the Senators Dean Eggleton, Jaffer and Ahmedvar, who have raised this issue with the Minister. Let me quote from his letter. I would like to thank you and your colleagues in the Senate for their dedication and hard work in examining both C-45 and C-46 over the past several months. I would also like to respond to some of the immigration concerns that have been raised with regard to the two bills. As you are aware, our government is committed to striking the right balance between making cannabis legally available to adults and protecting the health and safety of all Canadians, including young people. The stiff penalties included in Bill C-45 and 46 aim to deter criminal activity and keep our streets safe. At the same time, I appreciate your efforts to highlight the disproportionate immigration consequences that could result after these provisions come into force. I would like to assure you that I am committed to carefully considering and addressing the immigration consequences of Bills C-45 and 46. My department is examining the tools within my authority to mitigate immigration consequences, including in discretionary tools. Officials will also be proactively informing the public, including permanent residents, to make them aware of the possible immigration consequences for en engaging in prohibited cannabis-related criminal activities, as well as impaired driving involving drugs and alcohol. While I agree with the spirit of the proposed immigration-related amendments, I believe it is important to address the immigration con consequences in a more comprehensive matter, manner. By taking a more holistic approach, we will be able to consider how these new penalties affect all categories of immigrants, including permanent residents within and outside Canadian, Canada offences, as well as temporary residents. We will also be able to ensure that the approach is consistent with the overall framework for serious criminality in the Immigration Refugee Protection Act rather than carving out exemptions for certain offences. To this end, I am committed to working with senators and stakeholders to explore more comprehensive changes to the immigration policies and take appropriate action that will effectively mitigate the immigration consequences that result from C-45-46. Thank you for your work on this file, and I look forward to continued discussions on this important issue. Minister Hassan. I'd now like to turn uh, to the issue of swag. The other place uh, has respect of, respectfully declined the Senate amendment to impose further restrictions that would prohibit branding on anything that isn't cannabis itself. This amendment could prevent legitimate cannabis businesses from displaying their name or logo on a sign. Ontario's retail stores, for example, would not be able to indicate their location with signage featuring the store's logo, logo. In the government's view, this is a step too far. Such a restriction would hamper efforts to displace the illicit market, including through responsible and creative brand competition. Such a restriction also raises freedom of expression issues under the Charter, which in the government's view have not received sufficient scrutiny. The government certainly acknowledges the need for branding restrictions to meet the policy objective of discouraging youth consumption. However, the government has concluded that Bill C-45 and its regulations will provide adequate restrictions to protect youth from being influenced 
to use cannabis. The restrictions are evidence-based and informed by effective branding restrictions on tobacco. A government amendment that, uh, a Senate amendment that proposed a THC potency limit has been respectfully declined because the bill as drafted includes regulations to establish THC limits. Further, the bill provides flexibility to make future adjustments as needed should new evidence and new products require of them. Publication of investor information. The parliamentary secretary, Blair, noted in the other place, the Senate also adopted an amendment that would require the health minister to collect and publicly disclose the names of every holder of a license or permit, including persons who have control of or have shares in corporations holding a license. The amendment raises significant privacy concerns, which have not been adequately scrutinized. This amendment would also likely engender a number of operational challenges. For example, the inherent volatility of shareholding in publicly traded corporations could make the, report, the proposed reporting requirements practically impossible to meet and could cause extreme delays in licensing. Moreover, as Parliamentary Secretary Blair indicated, the amendment would also impose unprecedented requirements on businesses operating in the legal cannabis industry, making their treatment inconsistent with the treatment of businesses operating in other sectors of the Canadian economy. A proposed law was carefully designed to ensure it, it, that, it is current, that its current provisions com comply with privacy and other obligations and respect for the Charter. The government has robust physical and personal security screening processes in place for the existing medical cannabis industry designed to guard against infiltration by organized crime. For example, all officers and directors of a company must undergo thorough law enforcement record checks prior to licensing. As part of the new regulatory framework, Health Canada has proposed to expand the list of individuals that would require a security clearance to include the directors and officers of any controlling company in addition to those of the licensed company. As you know, an amendment adopted by the Social Affairs Committee and subsequently by this chamber gave the Health Minister expanded powers to require security clearances for cannabis permit and license holders. In the government's view, this, frame, framework, this framework strikes the right balance. Returning of seized cannabis. A Senate amendment has been respectfully declined that would have re relieved law enforcement of all responsibilities regarding the maintenance or preservation of seized cannabis plants. The amendment would also have established a regime for compensation for seized cannabis plants that have been ordered returned but have, per been per have perished or been destroyed. The government's reason for declining this amendment are also as follows. Essentially, the provisions set out in Bill C-45 were modelled on the provisions of the Controlled Drug and Substances Act, including Clause 105 for expedited disposition if there are health and safety risks, risks and Clause 106 to spe specifically destroy plants being produced contrary to provisions of the Act or regulations. However, a cannabis plant that has been seized by a peace officer falls into the jurisdiction of the court. The plant does not belong to a peace officer to do so, do with as the peace officer pleases. At the very least, a police officer must maintain the seized cannabis for evidentiary purposes of future proceedings. There is no provision in Bill C-45 indicating that law enforcement must keep seized cannabis plants alive. Where cannabis has been destroyed on an expedited basis, Section 105, or was other dis otherwise disposed of, Bill C-45 provides a mechanism for a court to order compensation equal to the value of the cannabis that was disposed of if a justice finds that a person is in the lawful owner and entitled to possess cannabis. Bill C-45 also allows the minister, on notice to the Attorney General, to cause the destruction of any cannabis plant that has been produced contrary to the proposed Cannabis Act, Section 106. This approach is consistent with the approach taken in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act in respect of controlled substances, which currently include cannabis, and is also consistent with government policy. Senate amendment requiring that future regulations regarding new cannabis products be presented in each house for 30 sitting days has been respectfully declined. The other place has con concluded 
that mechanisms are in place to allow for public scrutiny of federal regulations. As well, as I mentioned previously, the bill provides for a comprehensive review of the Cannabis Act, including the requirement to table a report in Parliament. In addition to being unnecessary, the government has concluded that from an operational perspective, such an amendment would be problematic. For example, the bill requires that the sale of edibles and concentrates be made legal no later than 12 months after the Cannabis Act comes into force. Comprehensive regulations for these products must therefore be in place. <coughs> However, in the interest of transparency, there will be public consultations on draft regulations. Indeed, the government has committed to consulting with Canadians on the development of regulations for cannabis edibles and concentrates this year. Honourable Senators, where the other place has disagreed with this chamber, public opinion has been alerted. With this message, elected members of Parliament have again expressed their views within an atmosphere of close public scrutiny. The subjects of disagreement have now been debated in the public discourse for many months. The Prime Minister, Ministers and Members of Parliament from all regions have weighed in on the public record. To those Senators who opposed this bill at second reading and again at third reading, but participated in good faith in committee and in the amendment process, I want to thank you for your positive engagement and constructive work. I anticipate you will stay involved as the, as the bill becomes law, for as S Bill C-45 now makes clear, there will be a review process and the scrutiny of the Senate will be called upon once again. To those honourable senators who have expressed broad agreement with the substance of the bill, thank you for your hard work and, and in all our processes and for putting forward amendments in good faith. And most of all, on the big picture, thank you for supporting an end to cannabis prohibition in Canada. Now, honourable senators, the Senate has has given its sober second thought, and the House of Commons has made a decision. It is appropriate that the House of Commons decide the final form of Bill C-45. It is the elected members of Parliament who Canadians sent to Ottawa to make these decisions on their behalf. It is members of Parliament who will be accountable to citizens for the details of Bill C-45's policies and its implementation come the next election. Finally, Honourable Senators, if we concur with the House of Commons, I think we will find most Canadians pleased with the manner in which we have discharged our constitutional role. I therefore submit that we adopt the motion before us, accepting the message from the other place and thereby passing historic legislation to end prohibition, legalize and strictly regulate and control cannabis in Canada. Thank you. Senator Harder, will you take a question? Questions uh, and ask you to clarify. We, you spent a lot of time talking about the four uh, plants. Uh, and uh, how did the government decide on four plants? Why not three, two, five, six, a garden? Uh, why did, how did they decide on four? Senator Harder. I thank the Honourable Senator for his question. Uh, the government, um, uh, in its consultation advice from the, from the task force, which I referenced, um, expressed the view that uh, it should be a limited number. It should be one that's easily identifiable and, and enforceable. Uh, and of course, as I indicated in my remarks, it is one where uh, provinces, territories, and indeed communities uh, can provide regulatory treatment to, uh, to reduce that number. Uh, or otherwise uh, regulate uh, the, uh, the home grow uh, of cannabis. Uh, what the government uh, has uh, maintained, though, is that in order to achieve the uh, objective of prohibition uh, and uh, strict regulation of, uh, of the home market, uh, the, the uh, flexibility of other jurisdictions uh, rests between one and four. And as I indicated, other jurisdictions have begun to exercise that uh, responsibility. Catch up. Just to follow up on that, uh, so uh, you mentioned in your speech uh, that you, uh, 
and you talked about the ability of the government to regulate the quality of the cannabis. Um, so I have, uh, and you also mentioned that it was a way to keep uh, cannabis away from young children. Perhaps you could maybe tell us uh, in, the, in the chamber, uh, how will the government regulate the quality of the cannabis that's grown in the home? And two, how, how is it possible to convincingly tell the Canadian public that you're trying to keep it away from minors when you're letting people grow it in their own home? Senator Harder. Again, let me, uh, thank you for the question, Senator. Let me start with the last part and, and uh, remind the senators uh, that the regulations surrounding uh, the conditions in which home growth can take place uh, uh, are uh, completely available to our partner um, provinces and, and municipalities and uh, territories, and indeed, as I enumerated, a number of them are taking, uh, taking that uh, control already and predicting how they would regulate uh, and otherwise protect uh, home growth from the very youth that the Senator references. Uh, with respect to the early part of the decision, uh, that is, in fact, one of the trade-offs and one of the advantages of the regulated uh, market, the market that will distribute legal cannabis for recreational purposes, is the advantage of, uh, of uh, quality control uh, and uh, one that uh, uh, ought to be attractive to the consumer. Uh, what uh, this home grow does is um, uh, act as a, uh, a measured response uh, to those Canadians who wish to uh, cultivate on their own. Senator Katchuk. One more question. I remember when the government had metric police to make sure that we were all following metric. How are you possibly going to regulate the quality of the marijuana and, and the ingredients of the marijuana in each people's, in each people's home? Are you, are you going to have police knock on their doors? Are you going to have a reporting system? Are you going to have video in the hallways? Uh, how, how is that going to be achieved? Harder. Senator, in the, in the um, if, it's not a complete parallel, but let's say in the home winemaking business. Uh, surely uh, the government doesn't regulate the um, amount of uh, alcohol in a bottle of wine that is home brewed. Uh, there's no police going around uh, in that re respect. Uh, what, uh, what we are seeking with the, um, with the home, home well, apples and oranges don't make wine. Uh, uh, what we are, I suppose they do. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> Uh, what, is it regulated? What, I, what I do know is that uh, the, the, uh, the, the home grow uh, proposal that the government has, uh, has adopted in the law uh, is one to respond to uh, the desire by Canadians uh, to have the ability to home cultivate for home consumption, not for distribution, and that is what is being provided for along with a strong and measured uh, control of, uh, of home grow by uh, provinces, territories, and municipalities. Bob. Another question? I'm still trying to, uh, when it I want to talk about the home cultivation of plants. And I certainly appreciate everybody who's been sincere, but the answer we're getting formally is to say uh, that this will contribute significantly to the reduction of the black market and so on. And in fact, I think the Prime Minister refers to studies and, and articles. And I've searched, including the task force, studies that could indicate, that could give me comfort that is the case. There is a relationship between home growth and reduction of black market. And I've done a web search. The only article that came up was a 2016 article in The Atlantic by a, a quote from Mark Varquez, who heads up the Colorado Pol Association of Police Chiefs Marijuana Working Group in Colorado. And he says just the opposite. In fact, in spite of the fact they allow home growth of similar to ours, there's been no reduction of the black market whatsoever, and I can't find anywhere there's a relationship between home market reduction of black market. Could you help me with that? Senator Harder. Yeah, thanks, Senator, for the question. Um, I, I, I will just make an observation with respect to um, the American experience, which is state-based, not national, um, and the enforcement tools that one could imagine a national... Sorry, I'm trying to be polite and, uh, and look at the questioner. Um, uh, with reference to the uh, sub-national um, jurisdictions of the United States that have legalized recreational cannabis and the question, 
Uh, it is a not entirely analogous situation to Canada because this is a national government and rules certainly around and, and authorities around uh, the regulation and the, um, uh, the enforcement of uh, the regime are, um, are, well, benefit from national treatment. Uh, and that's, uh, so I can't, I, I just don't uh, accept the Colorado findings. Uh, with the uh, comments that I made with respect to uh, amongst the reasons uh, cited by the government to uh, allow home grow uh, uh, the, the uh, desire uh, to not, uh, not have the illicit market continue to have access to those who consume through uh, home grow operations uh, uh, would otherwise be uh, uh, enticed to uh, uh, the illicit market because of remote or, or uh, uh, northern communities or um, perhaps affinities of relationships that are pre-existing. What the government is seeking to do is do all it can to constrain and over time eliminate the illicit market. That is one of the reasons for allowing home grow uh, of up to four, but have, being able to restrict down to one. Restricting further would undermine the other pillar of the whole effort here, which is to end prohibition. And we are ending prohibition, as a as should Parliament wish, we will end prohibition and have very strict regulation and control of cannabis uh, in this country. Senator Massacre. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the clarification. I certainly recognize that every jurisdiction is different. Uh, but I, I wouldn't mind if I could get a copy of the studies that so referred to, Prime Minister referred to, the, the studies that exist that shows the direct correlation between the black market and number of plants at home. Could we get that information? I'll, make every, I'll make every effort. Thank you. Would you take another question? Yes, my question is also to dealing with the home cultivation. And you were talking about rental housing units such as condos and apartments where the landlord or the condo board could impose restrictions. And I wasn't sure whether you said they could restrict it to one or zero plants. One plant? Zero. They can restrict it to zero. Interesting. Now my follow-up question to that has to do with uh, on reserve housing. Because you know on reserves most uh, housing is social housing. It's rental, and in many reserves, of course, then they have uh, housing authorities that, that set the housing policy. So then they, the housing board or, or a group on the reserve then could set a policy that says we will not allow homegrown uh, in our social housing houses. Senator Harder. Senator, where organizations have that legal capacity? Sorry, Senator Harder. I'm going to have to place your Sorry. Where, uh, where organizations uh, have that uh, legal capacity to restrict through uh, 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 condo or, or uh, other uh, regulatory features, uh, that is possible. Dick. Could you find out and, and let us know whether the housing authorities on reserves have that kind of legal authority? Because I think that's very important information for individual First Nation reserves to know. Yes, I will do so. Question? Yes, uh, question, please, to Senator Harder. Um, Senator Harder, I, I think we're familiar with situations uh, in, in a home. This is about social sharing, uh, where uh, a glass of wine may be passed on to a younger person in the family during a festive season uh, meal, um, wine, beer, whatever. Um, and I suppose that's technically illegal, but nobody ever pays any attention to that. Uh, I suppose the uh, father or the mother or the adult could get a fine, but that doesn't ever seem to happen. But in this particular case, the government's drawing a very clear line here by not accepting an amendment that was put forward and adopted by this house. In fact, the, the parent in this case could become a criminal, uh, which 
seems very much out of place with the concept of the glass of wine or the beer. And after all, the government has been saying that the cannabis is no worse than alcohol. And you said tonight that criminalization will end with this bill. Well, how do you reconcile that with social sharing? Senator Harner. Thank you, Senator, for your question. As, as I um, indicated in my remarks, uh, the, uh, the government's view is that uh, to move forward with this piece of legislation, it is important to strictly regulate uh, the distribution of uh, cannabis uh, to youth uh, that are not of age, uh, depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, and that that message is one that is very important for uh, parents, uh, for other youth uh, to hear, lest we inadvertently uh, create uh, a, um, a, uh, uh, an incentive uh, for uh, underage consumption. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I'm not very satisfied with that answer, but I, because I, I think, I understand the government's, I, I know what you're saying in terms of the government's position, but it hasn't answered the concern it led to the amendment. It hasn't answered the concern that we have about this issue of social uh, sharing. Another aspect of the social sharing is, and this is something that we hear about commonly, you know, if a bunch of young people are together and they're passing a joint around, uh, well, uh, some of them could be under 18 and some of them could be over 18. They could be very close in, in age. And yet the government's taking a very hard line between 17 and 18 to give example. Well, all right, you may think so, but I, 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 I think the concern here is that even 18, 19, 20-year-olds, these are young people too, maybe not in the terms of the age of majority in the law, but even the, the prime minister recognizes uh, youth as being into their 20s. He has a youth council that goes between age 16 and 24. So, Again, here, there's a very hard line being drawn that somebody that 18 could be given this criminal record, which, as you said in your remarks, you would think is unfortunate because they will have difficulties getting a job and, and stigma and all the other things. But why does it take such a hard line between those two ages? Senator Harder. Again, Senator, I, um, I, I would ask you to, well, in, in fact, Let's agree to disagree. The government has concluded, in respect of, uh, of uh, social sharing, uh, that uh, it is indeed comfortable taking this, what you call a strict line, uh, because they are of the view uh, that as we implement uh, the legalization and strict control of cannabis, we must send a message uh, to youth and to parents as to where the lines are in terms of, uh, of ensuring uh, protection of those who are outside of legal uh, consumption age. Uh, that is a view the government has formed uh, that is consistent with its overall architecture of this bill. Uh, and I understand that it is one that not all senators will agree with, but I would ask you to respect the ability of governments to make those decisions. Senator Harder, you're uh, now well past 50 minutes of your time, but I see a couple of other senators uh, standing. Please take your seat, Senator Foray. I see a couple of other senators standing, uh, obviously, who wish to answer questions. Are you prepared to take some more questions? Certainly. Senator Foray. Mr. President, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator, I have a question for you. It's an important question. Now, I'm trying to get a handle on the logic from the other place that would authorize uh, public uh, owners to prohibit uh, in their condo properties, in their institutions, in their establishments, uh, homegrown marijuana, but that would not grant that power to a government that is legitimately elected uh, by Canadians, the very same Canadians. Uh, that uh, are, comprise the other place, in fact, as well. So I don't understand the rationale in Canada's legislative system that we would give individuals a right that is not also accorded to a legitimately elected government. Um, now, when you say you can legislate on the number of plants, well, zero is also 
a possible number. Well, Senator, for his question, let me um, uh, repeat uh, that the government's view of the legislative pillars is uh, prohibition, ending prohibition, strictly regulating and control uh, the distribution uh, of cannabis, and uh, undermining the illicit uh, market. Uh, as part of that architecture, uh, you will know that the government has, uh, uh, has entered into a large number of discussions with provinces uh, as to how enforcement and distribution will take place, how the proceeds will be uh, shared uh, from uh, revenues. Uh, what it has done with respect to home cultivation is say uh, the architecture of our bill is clear, but we do recognize that jurisdictions might wish to restrict lower than four. But when you go to zero, you are undermining the prohibition uh, um, uh, imp imperative, which is fundamental to undermining the, uh, the illicit market. Uh, so there is a good deal of flexibility uh, that provinces and territories are already intending on exercising. What that flexibility doesn't do is allow to go to zero because of the pol policy uh, uh, challenges that that would face. What the government has said is that in respect of the provinces that have legislated to zero, the government of Canada will not take them to court. But individual Canadians who have also the right now to home cultivation within the prescribed uh, regulatory frameworks may do that. Uh, with respect to the, the point you, that you make with regard to um, an elected um, uh, government at the provincial level, absolutely. But I would also remember, if we're talking about Quebec, that earlier today, 56 members of parliament from Quebec uh, voted to support the message as I've sent it, uh, as I've said it, and those represented not just liberal members of parliament, but all new Democratic Party members from Quebec. So they, they would feel equally entitled to express their views of what is in Quebec's interest, what is in their community's interest, what is in, in their constituents' interest. And I would ask that we, unelected chamber, respect that. Oh, question? Uh, Senator Harder, I just want to reconfirm that uh, you mentioned early, earlier about condominium board. Condominium board has set, can set a bylaw set the bylaw to ban anything they think is not suitable for condominium living. So would the condominium bylaw supersede the government's regulation on home cultivation? Senator, as I have indicated that the uh, government is uh, intending on working with condominium associations and other um, multiple dwelling associations to um, uh, remind them of uh, their um, uh, their jurisdiction to regulate um, uh, through agreements uh, the um, uh, restrictions on, on home cultivation. Uh, that is one where, as I've indicated, a number of provinces uh, have already um, indicated that they will be doing that, uh, and it's one that uh, uh, helps um, balance the, the rights of an individual uh, who owns a dwelling and the uh, rights of uh, a condo who holds it in common or uh, an owner who owns uh, a building that is a rental unit. Senator Malte. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Senator. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Senator Harder, we, in our, we are in a parliament to, today where we're going to vote uh, on a bill that affects uh, all Canadians from coast to coast to coast. Uh, now, we're a number of Canadians uh, to break the law, they would be prosecuted. Quebec, a week ago, adopted uh, Bill C-157, making it uh, illegal to have any homegrown marijuana plants. How will Quebecers reconcile these two pieces of legislation? One overseeing the province of Quebec, for which the Sûreté du Québec will be responsible for enforcing the law, and another piece of legislation from the central government uh, where the RCMP will have to enforce the law. 
Senator Maltea, you asking a question. My question is, uh, how do you reconcile the two in the case of civil disobedience? Federalism in Canada. Uh, the, the government of Canada has respectfully uh, established the parameters of a national uh, framework for the legalization of cannabis. That absolutely requires the cooperation of provinces uh, in the, uh, in the uh, coming into force of that law. And um, as I mentioned, there are a number of ways in which uh, the government, uh, both its legislative framework and its implementation, uh, 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 intends that cooperation to extend. Again, what it has done from a national framework point of view is allowed home cultivation uh, and also allowed provinces, territories, and municipalities to um, form some restrictions short of prohibition. Uh, that will uh, obviously, in the scenario that you're describing, uh, be one that uh, uh, may well end up uh, with uh, some uh, uh, legal guidance uh, from, um, from the courts. Uh, but that is, at least I want senators to understand the policy parameters around the government's position, which is entirely consistent with the overall framework of this legislation. Yes, to a certain extent. But I just want to remind you, uh, given your age, that I've been Canadian for a bit tad longer than you, Senator. Now, Senator, uh, uh, Quebecers uh, are being left in a legal void. The only option they'll have is the courts. Is it normal that a parliament would vote in legislation where Quebecers would automatically end up in front of the Supreme Court? Is that normal? Well, Senator, uh, I guess the, uh, we could say we live in hope that the government of Quebec will, uh, will uh, change its uh, point of view. Uh, but if not, the framework uh, that the government has articulated and the delegation of, uh, of restraining uh, 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 and constricting uh, home grow are those that the government has articulated. It's moved by the Honourable Senator Martin, seconded by the Honourable Senator Smith, that further debate be adjourned until the next sitting of the Senate. It's your pleasure, Honourable Senators, to adopt the motion.